The other leaders are challenged. They thought they had <laughs> a sure shot. No doubt about it. Our, our John Neal, he's a sinner. He's our man. And then just as they're snatching the soul of a John Neal from the core of the heart, the Vishnu Judas show up because a John Neal happened to say the name of their eye. So, as you know, the other Judas are baffled. Wait a minute. We are doing the right thing. But yet we see you're so beautiful, they tell the Vishnu Judas. So the Vishnu Judas explain, are you sure you're doing the right thing? Do you actually know what is Dharma? So the Yama Judas are now defending themselves and giving the correct understanding of what goes on in material nature and why they have a job to do. And very importantly, the Yama Judas say, look, you may be acting pious, piously for a while in this world. You may take a trip to the heavenly planets, but look, the way the deal is arranged, sooner or later, we get you. <laughs> That's the way the material world is constructed. <laughs> sooner or later, you're going to trip up. The modes of material nature are that vicious. And, and that's why sooner or later we see everyone in material existence. Mm. Very sobering realities. We see here the principle in today's verse that no one is innocent. The Yamadudas are echoing almost completely what Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita. No one can stop from acting. No one can stop from engaging in the soup of material existence. Not even for a moment. One must act by his sabhava, sabhavaka, one's natural tendency. That means one's natural material tendency. Because the three modes of material nature, they'll hook on to your material proclivities and drag you in a certain way. You're already set up. You are already programmed by your material nature, your subhavika, to be dragged in certain ways by the modes of material nature. It's a setup. No one likes to be set up. But material nature is indeed the biggest setup arrangement. And the amazing thing is, we, we can't believe it. It can't be that bad, really. Somehow, or other, there must be some good times, some good moments. There must be some fulfillment. And we get so desperate, as I often explain, that if we just have a few moments in the sun, we get so giddy and delirious. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can't see the whole picture of what's going on. In fact, we don't want to see the whole picture. Just think, do I really want to see the whole picture? Or would I rather have just a few moments of different time? What do you think? <laughs> really, seeing the whole picture, what will it, what can it do for you? You may know everything, but that, you may not have any fun. This is the Kali Yuga standard today. Better to not know everything and have some fun. <laughs> the all-important question, are you having fun now? <laughs> look at your relationships. Look at your job. Look at your studies. Look at anything and ask, am I being entertained right now? <laughs> look at your relatives, your family members, your friends. Are they entertaining you? <laughs> the way it works these days is, if they're not, just get rid of them. <laughs> Everyone has to entertain, from the president on down. <laughs> what are you doing for me at this moment? No one has any inclination to understand the complete picture. Because people will, the argument is, I'll be discouraged if I can see the complete picture. 
People want to feel encouraged that they have something to achieve. If they see the whole picture, uh, they won't be motivated. So they, they complain about that. You Hare Krishnas may know so much, but is knowing so much really necessary? Especially if that knowledge inhibits your ability to just act in material nature without care and concern, which is the way to have a good time. <laughs> so let's think about this. We're set up. It's difficult for us to accept our helplessness. No one likes to accept that. There's got to be options. The first chapter of Bhagavad Gita is a little rugged because Arjuna seems to have no options. In our conditioned nature, uh, we're thinking, well, I've got some options, I've got some ways out, I've got some hopes and dreams. Of course, inevitably those hopes and dreams crash. But we're so stubborn, <laughs> we will not relinquish our grip on material nature. We'll take shelter of material nature even more. We'll say, I've got to work harder, or I need more intoxication. My lady in, in Canada, she was a TV producer, and she was asking me how to cope with rivalry and competition at her job in the TV, at a TV network. So I gave her some pointers. Um, don't really expect fulfillment from a job, even a job that seems to involve artistic production. Because actually you're just dancing to the you have to dance to the whims of those who pull the strings. So it was, you know, don't take it so seriously. Uh, learn how to work for supporting your Krishna consciousness. Next time I returned, I heard. She had been fired. And what was her conclusion after being fired? It's just natural. Only drugs will solve the situation. <laughs> but you have a, not a down and out person, um, but a person who is a professional, has talents, but the way modern society works is you have your intoxication option. So that was her conclusion. Just get deep into the intoxication and after a while snap out of it and see you know, what you can do in the world. <clears throat> this, is, this is considered a logical and necessary option to blind yourself uh, so that once again, after a while, you can take to the process of material existence with renewed vigor. No one likes to feel helpless you like to feel you have strength, you have ability. But the Yamadudas are skillfully explaining how the deck is stacked against you. Just like in Malvar, Shakuni gave the Pandavas loaded dice uh, to play, to gamble with the Koravas. Uh, that way, there was cheating going on. So, material nature is loaded. But we have a hard time believing that. Often we say, for example, what's the point, and you may hear this, people ask this question, what's the point in transmigrating the soul going from one body to another if you can't remember what you did in your previous life that brought about particular common reactions in this life? There's a fault in the system. If karma is just, then we should be able to remember, in my past life I did action X, which specifically in this life brought about reaction Y. That's the way the system should be. And because the system is not like that, we only have a few options to consider. Either the system is unjust, or the system doesn't exist at all. These are the options. <laughs> and, of course, if indeed the system is unjust, and if we accept
step that there's someone who has designed that system, that means the ultimate designer is unjust. All the more reason to ignore it. <laughs> or, as I said, the system doesn't exist at all. How could there indeed be such a system? Uh, in an ordered universe, how can there be a system that's so out of whack as apparently karma is that you can't remember why you were punished? If you commit a crime, you're caught, you go to court, and the judge tells you, you, you did this and that, and such and such and such and such. <clears throat> you can't plea bargain, you're not able to turn anyone else in, so <laughs> you're going to get the full brunt of the law. And so you know, I did this, and I got a certain reaction. This conception is very important in liberal Western democracies, jurisprudence. Uh, the courts should function in such a way that the guilty person understands exactly what he or she did wrong and exactly the reaction you're getting so that you won't do it again. Actually, this notion in Western liberal democracies is not worldwide. In fact, in most countries of the world, uh, what happens to you in court has no correlation to any principle of justice. It's all about how much you can pay. And most people accept that's the way the world is. So even on the material platform, our that, that view that there should be mm, knowledge of what you did in the past so that you can understand why you're getting the specific re reaction now. Uh, even that conception isn't, it, it's a minority in the world. Uh, you'd be surprised in many countries of the world, most countries of the world, everyone knows if you get dragged into court somehow or other, you're helpless. Anything can happen. Try to pay your way out of the situation. That's all you can do. No one accepts that there is any, any justice, as Westerners and liberal democracies think. It's all about how much can you pay. Of course, even in Western liberal democracies, uh, you pay for a top lawyer, you'll, you'll do much better. I remember one devotee in the southern part of Russia. He was a criminal prosecutor. And so I asked him, uh, does it, is it, uh, does it happen? Is it possible that there can be uh, court decisions that aren't influenced by bribery? And he looked at me and thought for, for a few seconds, it can happen sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> It can happen sometimes. <laughs> In other words, everyone just accepts the reality. <laughs> Eventually, he gave up his job because he just couldn't handle it. He had gone to university, studied law, and he said, basically, all I'm doing day and night is just arranging bribes. That's what it means to be a lawyer. <laughs> it's not about the law. That's just a window dressing. It's all about how much you can pay. So I'm just a, I'm just a broker. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer. Hmm. So then we look at the Amadudis and their presentation. Uh, they don't accept the point that because you can't remember exactly what you did in a previous life, uh, therefore karma is faulty. They have a different angle. <clears throat> they say, just as springtime in the present indicates the nature of springtimes in the past and future. So this life of happiness, distress, or mixture of both gives evidence concerning the religious and irreligious activities of one's past and future lives. And in the purport, as you heard a few days ago, Prabhupada explains, our past and future are not very difficult to understand. For time is under the contamination of three modes of material nature. We have to try to see things through the lens of the Bhagavad Gita. We might say across the 
speak in my office at the BBT when this chapter first came from Shil Prabhupada. I was looking at the manuscript. Okay. As springtime in the present indicates the nature of springtimes in the past and future, so this life of happiness, distress, or mixture of both gives evidence concerning the religious and irreligious activities of one's past and future lives. Hmm. Well, I want to know exactly what I did that brought about exactly what's happening to me now. But the Bible term is given a different lens. <laughs> a different lens on what's going on in the past, present, and future. And we should try to understand why that lens is superior. There's some cultural hang-up in us. And it's probably due to Western jurisprudence, particularly those from countries of liberal Christian democracy background. They always get on this point. Why can't I remember exactly what I did in the past so I know exactly why I'm suffering in a particular way now? This is not a majority view in the world anymore. But anyway, uh, that conditioning is there. From the lens viewpoint of the Bible time, it is not necessary for us to know exactly what we did in the past uh, in terms of this activity has led to exactly this result. Look at the overall picture. And the overall picture is a no-brainer. <laughs> Just like springtime, we look at spring. Of course, take away any question of climate change. <laughs> Things like climate change obviously aren't a consideration when you have a sane human society. So, uh, springtime now, at least anyway, down under, it's springtime now. <laughs> Let's you know the nature of springtimes that have happened in the past and springtimes that will come in the future. You don't need to get into the details. It's not important. What is most important is that you take up the means to escape the grip of karma. Focus on the specifics about that, of getting out of the clutches of material existence. Focus on the specifics of the process to get out of material existence. So it's a completely, the Bhagavatam is giving us a completely different way of looking at things. Now, someone might object, and I've heard it again and again. Wouldn't it be better if we knew exactly what we did? And why don't we know exactly what we did? That's a fault, either, as we said, in the system, in the creator of the system, or else it means the system doesn't exist. But let's look at things from the viewpoint of Bhagavatam. The whole point of being a conditioned soul and going through material existence is not that you rely on your own prowess. So I remember what I did in the past. And why am I suffering now? No. The whole point is you are helpless and Shastra is your beacon. So if you turn to the Shastra, you can understand all that you're supposed to understand. So it's not that Maya is set up to give you knowledge. This is a common mistake people make. Material nature and my interaction with it should illuminate me. I should learn by experience. No, that's not, as we so often explain, the job of Maya to educate. Maya is not the educational department. Oh, I'm your friend Maya. Let me show you what you did in the past life and so that you can understand specifically why you have a certain type of suffering in this life. I am Maya. My job is to let you see. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. And we have a hard time getting this in our heads. It seems natural. I should learn by experience. I should gain by countless births. I should be aware. No. Material nature is a ripoff. And we have a hard time accepting that. Because no one likes to admit that they are a fool. <laughs> Even in our helpless situation with your own nature, we don't like to have been for a fool. And the only resort for illumination is the Shastra. But that's the way the 
this system is set up. Now, of course, we have a problem with the system. Why is it that we have to turn to Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam to understand what's going on? I mean, that sounds sectarian to me. I can't handle that. I mean, I'm a good person, and uh, I want to help people, and uh, mm, uh, I, I think positively. Uh, so why can't I know all that I need to know just by existing in this world? What about my intuition? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the system is not set up in that way. The job of material energy is to be will be. Not only one time, but again and again and again. It's difficult for us to accept these points because we're so full of ourselves. I'm so intelligent. I'm kind of handsome or cute in my own way. <laughs> I've got a special personality. I mean, if people would just get to know it better, surely they would agree. <laughs> We have this cockiness about us. <laughs> and that is the gift of contact modes of material nature. We've got no reason to think we're unique and special, uh, materially speaking, but yet we do. <coughs> so, let's just think about it. If we look at things another way, and that's the whole point of Bhagavatam, to get you to look at things with a different lens, then we see that materially, although the system is rigged so it will never become illuminated, there is the Shastra to give the light. So it's not that Krishna is unjust for setting up such a system. The system works perfectly if you know how to play it. The system is not designed so you learn by experience or you learn by memory of what you did in your past life. If you look at Nalakuver and Mani Griva, for example, all right, Narayuni gave them that simultaneous curse blessing to the trees in Vrindavan for 100 years, the time of Janana, and then they would see Krishna face to face and go back to God. So Narayuni happened to package into that curse blessing the uh, ability for Nalakuva and Mani Griva to remember as they took tree bodies, they could remember what went on. So we say, ah, just see, there it is. Now why can't we all have that? But this ability mm, to remember specifically the past life and what you did wrong uh, is not the main part of this past life. The main part of this past life is simply the mercy of Narada Muni. Krishna himself, as Baba Pab, was not directly concerned with the sons of Kuvera. Shila <laughs> Vishnu Chakri Thakur says, Krishna is thinking, who are these rich boys? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a simple cowherd boy, what am I going to do with these rich boys? The <laughs> sons of Kuvera puffed up. <laughs> but, my devotee Narada Muni has arranged the situation, so therefore I'll comply. That is the important part. Now when he happened along to where Nalakuber and Money Griever were indulging in activities that will be glorified in Los Angeles today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a, what a what real man! What upstanding citizens! <laughs> Beacons for all of humanity! They're having a holiday! Wonderfully drunk. <laughs> and not only are they wonderfully drunk, but they're sporting in a celestial river with young ladies. And they all happen to have uh, disposed of their clothes. Oh, this is the pinnacle of human civilization. <laughs> are you some are you a Taliban or something? You're against it? <laughs> it's a problem with the world. People like you who protest against pure human pleasures. <laughs> well, now I'm ready. The Shastra says, Yudhishthaya, by chance, he happened, he happened alone. 
But this Yudhishthaya is not like uh, what uh, people today consider remote chance uh, in, a, in a meaningless universe. It's that wherever Narayuni goes, he creates meaning, he creates auspicity, wherever he goes. So it, it, it's Narayuni's service to just wander here and there and bestow mercy. <laughs> so it's not just like a random occurrence. He is acting in tune with the deepest purposes of the cosmic creation, which is to reform the conditioned souls. So therefore he saw the woeful condition of Nalakubera Manigrita. And yes, he was a bit angry, but it was pure anger. His anger was significant enough that Pritchett Maharaj, in hearing from Sri Vedanta Swami, questioned Sri Vedanta Swami, what is a great soul like Nara Muni doing, feeling tamarun? Tamarun, he's angry. Uh, Pritchett Maharaj, when he asks questions, that means we should pay attention. Quality questions lead to a quality life. Uh, so, Bridget Raj is showing us, this is where to focus your lens. Look at this. Narayuni, was he really angry like an ordinary person? And of course, Sri Goswami explained that it was a simultaneous first blessing. And the important thing is the blessing of Narayuni. Whether or not Nalikubera and Manigiba remember their past life is not the crux of the matter. So they, once Krishna liberated them from the Yamalaraji bodies, they thanked Narayuni for his mercy. So the key to our situation in material existence is not about can we remember or not. Uh, let's once again, keep out those Western liberal democracy conceptions of jurisprudence. Let's keep it out of this, our analysis and let's try to accept the lens that Bhagavatam gives us. There is illumination. It doesn't come from memory, your faulty material memory, with a mind and intelligence composed of the modes of material nature. How is that going to help you? The illumination comes from the Shastra and the wanderings, apparently by chance of devotees. In this way, if the conditioned soul takes shelter of the Shastra and takes shelter of the wanderings of devotees, the situation of being trapped in material existence can be rectified. One last point. Uh, <clears throat> we see in today's verse about tendencies. Listen. The living enemy wants to serve. How does that fit? How does that fit with us? I want to serve. I mean, how many of you wake up in the morning, whether in material or spiritual life, I want to serve today. <laughs> but yet, the Shastra is telling us you actually want to serve, and therefore you'll manufacture, under the most ritual nature, you'll manufacture various modes of service. So we have to use that lens to look at our life. Of course, many of you here get up in the morning wanting to serve Krishna. But our point that we're discussing is that whether you are a Krishna Bhakta or a slave of the material energy, you want to serve. <laughs> and therefore, in material life, you manufacture various modes of service. This serving propensity is also considered the loving propensity in the beginning of nectar worship. <coughs> you want to love, and every activity has a particular taste that you're pursuing. The science of rasa as manifested in the material world. So we get all this uh, knowledge. Another point explained by Bhaktu no Thakur, about being carried away by the waves of material energy. We're given a picture of how to see ourselves. Sometimes you are drowning, and sometimes you are tossed like a 
swimmer struggling in the ocean. So even in our best moments, <laughs> when we're not drowning in material existence, we're struggling like a swimmer. It's never smooth sailing for long, but the relief from drowning makes us think that while we're struggling on top of the waves, these are good times. <laughs> so we need the lens of Bhagavatam to rearrange our intelligence, especially since our intelligence is a material construct. This is talked about in text 51. The subtle body is endowed with 16 parts. And this subtle body is an effect of the three modes of material nature. It is composed of insurmountably strong desires. And therefore it causes the living energy to transmigrate. So when you get the body of the demigod, you're very jubilant. It's like when you're on holiday, you know, vacation. Oh, the good times were all, I feel good. The demigod life. When you get the body of a human being, you're always lamenting. Because you just can't get enough of material happiness. There's always some impediment. <laughs> it's like traffic in Los Angeles. You're driving, you know, sometimes mysteriously there's no traffic. And how do you feel? Wow! <laughs> this is great! No traffic! <laughs> that even ask, you know, where's the traffic? I do. You know, I've drove the motors to drive. Like, where's the traffic? What happened? <laughs> But you know, most of the time, there's traffic. <laughs> Even in the middle of the day now. So, uh, we mistake happiness to be, you know, oh, there's no traffic. <laughs> because most of the time, there is traffic. So simply, most of the time, we're drowning in the waves of material existence. And then, sometimes we're above the waves. We're still struggling as swimmers. We, this is great. I'm not drowning. <laughs> so this is the lens of the Bhagavatam. It's completely different, and <laughs> the Bhagavatam is meant to give us light, especially in this dense darkness of the age of color. We need to look at things different, uh, and then we'll understand why it's not so important that we remember exactly what we did in the past life. Uh, memory is not going to save us, whether we remember or not. The whole point is Shastra will allow you to see and the mercy of a devotee will uh, ignite our dormant propensity for serving us. I'll stop here. Any questions? Yes, uh, Druta Karma Prabhu. I mean, if I answer this question, you'll give me a copy of the new book. <laughs> <laughs> was a setup. You know, 
example of someone having a nightmare and you're watching a person shake in bed and break out in a cold sweat, actually don't suffer. A son of a guy, so. There's never any real connection between the spirit, soul, and matter. You simply imagine that there's a connection. That's the wonderful job of the false ego. To create an imaginary junction between matter and spirit. So we have to give artistic credit to Krishna. What an amazing device in which we go through all sorts of unnecessary hallucinations, but actually we're not touched. But we need knowledge to realize we're not actually touched. Would it be correct to say Krishna's not torturing you, you're torturing yourself? Yes, because as the Shastra points out, actually you can say with some merit or truth, not the ultimate truth, that it is due to the the desires of the conditioned soul that the material world is created. Krishna is not overtly invested in the existence of the material world, but because of your desires, it happened. Of course, Krishna allowed it to happen, but he's not like a directly invested, personally invested in letting it happen. Example I sometimes give it's like a kid keeps bothering his mother I, uh, I want to buy this, give me money, I want to buy this, I want to buy this, I want to buy this. And mother says, it's not necessary, why do you want it? I'm not going to be happy if you get it. Uh, and the kid keeps bugging the mother, so finally the mother says, hey, look, you know, there's a credit card in the other room in the drawer, you know. <laughs> Go take Okay, you want it? Go take the credit card, get whatever you want to get, you'll find out. But it's like, it's off to the side, like, uh, it's not germane, it's not mm, the essential characteristic of that person. It's just, you keep pressuring me, I've told you it won't work. Anyway, I'm not going to just hand you the credit card, it's over in the other room, it's in the one. Parents do like that. <laughs> but Krishna, we must understand, is an artist. <clears throat> if you protest Krishna's artistry, ultimately means impersonalism. Why do you do things this way? Well, because that's the way Krishna does things. Now, with knowledge, we'll understand that Krishna's way is best. So ultimately, a lot of these questions are based on impersonalism. I don't like the way Krishna does things, therefore Krishna doesn't exist. <laughs> like, why is Krishna blue? <laughs> why do you set up the material world so that we're dreaming when actually we're not touched? You got a better idea how to handle the situation? <laughs> You know so much, what are you doing here? <laughs> Archie Tupper Boo. Thank you for a wonderful question. Back to your point, the question that you say get a lot. Say it. Even if you remember, which many people do in this life, they've done something, they've stolen something, they got caught, it was proven, they got put in jail, and they got, came out, they remember it, but they still went back and did it again. And they suffered again, and again, and again. So remembering doesn't mean that you're going to rectify. So what's, re what's required is a system of reformation. And that's what this, this whole Bhakti path is about, reforming your consciousness. Whether you remember or not, I mean, you need to be reformed, and here's the formula. I'm important. Anything else? Okay, just watch the clock. I'm about to approve <coughs> Maharaj, again, thank you for a very nice class. Uh, uh, my question is, you very lucidly pointed out how we're set up in the material world, even though uh, we even under can understand philosophically the way things are set up, as alluded to in this verse, because we're under the three modes of material nature, we're being forced to act in so many ways, even beyond our desire to act in such ways. Um, and we understand that through Krishna consciousness, that uh, we can actually overcome the influence of the three modes of material material nature. And so my question is, how important is the institution of an ashram and dharma? And uh, can it actually be, uh, can we actually set it up and, and it become a workable system in uh, this Pramukhali? 
the importance of Varashandana is that it's Krishna's material system. Once again, Krishna's artistry. He's 